Thank you, Martin. Thank you for the very kind invitation. Um, apparently, the reason that I'm here is that uh, I know less about anesthesia and intensive care compared to anyone in this auditorium. But I will try to share some thoughts about reducing waste or improving value and utility in uh, healthcare research. Most clinical research is not useful. I think that all of us realize that when we come across all these millions of papers that surround us, very little of that can be taken to active healthcare uh, in a meaningful way, in a way that it will change outcomes. Why is that? Most of the criteria that we want to see for useful research are not there. For research to be useful, we need to have a problem to solve. There needs to be a problem base. A lot of research is done, and then we think, is there some problem that we're after? No, but it's still a published paper. Context placement, how much do we know already, and have we managed to put a systematic review in place of what we know before we launch a new study? Information gain, do we estimate that we will learn something, that we will change the entropy of the system? Information gain is a, is a physics entity, it's the same as entropy. Regardless of what the result will be, uh, not just if it's a spectacular, statistically significant, huge effect. Pragmatism, uh, does it really reflect real life? And if it deviates from real life, is that still acceptable? Can we still take it to the real world? Patient centeredness. Have we asked patients what do they care about, what is important for them, and then adjust our design and our outcomes accordingly? Value for money. Uh, we are living in a situation where our budgets are very limited when we try to do research. Is that the best investment compared to other questions or other designs or other priorities? Feasibility. Can it be done? About 35% of surgical trials are not finished because of futility. We have an expectation that we will be able to recruit patients, but we cannot even get anywhere close to that. And finally, transparency, an issue of trust. Are the methods, the data, the analysis verifiable and unbiased? Can we trust what we read? Trust is fundamental in science. This is how science began. Well, a scientist had to trust another scientist that what was being communicated was not fraud. Um, and fraud may be an extreme situation, although in anesthesia uh, you're very well aware of several cases of uh, highly prolific fraudulent authors. But the far more common problem is not fraud. It's uh, people who are not fraudulent, but nevertheless they're not transparent in their research methods, in the data, uh, in what has been done about a study. One might say that maybe one way to solve the problem is to just read papers published in New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, BMJ, uh, maybe a top or two specialty journals. This will not make the problem go away. Most of the studies published, even in these journals, are lacking most of these criteria for fundamental utility. Moreover, most useful research will not make it to these journals because uh, for the simple fact that uh, these journals publish only a very, very thin slice of the literature, there will still be valuable information scattered across the broad horizon of uh, the bibliography. Over the last uh, three decades, there has been a lot of discussion about evidence-based medicine. I was uh, much younger uh, when uh, David Sackett and his team and Gordon Wyatt uh, and McMaster proposed the term evidence-based medicine. And I was very enthusiastic at that time that we would be able to really make tremendous progress and say uh, the world, or at least solve many of the problems of uh, evidence. Many years later, I wrote that paper um, in memory of uh, David Sackett, uh, where I acknowledged that evidence-based medicine has been hijacked, unfortunately. We have been very successful, maybe notoriously successful, 
you hear the word evidence and evidence-based medicine everywhere, in every session, in every meeting, in every journal. However, the agenda of evidence-based medicine has been hijacked by stakeholders who have very little to do with evidence and its utility to save lives and to improve patient outcomes. Here's a snapshot of how good the quality of the clinical evidence is at the moment, or pretty recently. We looked at close to 1,400 systematic reviews in the Cochrane Library that had been compiled within a year and a half. We asked how many of them have grade assessments, which are the grades of recommendation, assessment, development, and evaluation. And 43% had this type of assessment. The others did not have this assessment mostly because there was no evidence to appraise. For many, in many specialties, most of the clinical questions do not have any randomized evidence that one could assess uh, whether it is of any good quality. For those that we could assess the quality, only 13.5% had high quality of the evidence. And even when you ask for at least one out of many primary outcomes to have high quality, that goes up to 19%. If you seek high quality of evidence, as well as statistically significant results, even with a very lenient, less than 0 0.05 uh, uh, p-value, and a favorable interpretation of the intervention at the end of the day, then you're left only with 25 reviews out of 1,400, slightly less than 2%, where statistics is in place, clinical interpretation is in place, and quality is there. Very, very tiny proportion. So what we are living is a world of medical misinformation mess, or what I call MMM. It sounds a little bit like m and but it's not as tasty. Much published medical research is not reliable or is of uncertain reliability. It offers no benefit to patients or is not useful to decision makers. Most healthcare professionals are not aware of this problem. We teach our students and our residents and our fellows lots of things, lots of details, lots of quote unquote basic science, uh, lots of uh, esoteric pieces of knowledge, but we don't really teach them about that serious elephant in the room. Even if they are aware of the problem, most healthcare professionals lack the skills necessary to evaluate the reliability and the usefulness of medical evidence. Uh, that's not part of their everyday life, their everyday exposure in dealing with patients and clinical situations, integrating the evidence as it appears in front of their eyes in terms of the medical decision making. And also, patients and families frequently lack the relevant, accurate medical evidence and skill guidance at the time of shared decision making. Shared decision making sounds very nice, but how can you share in decision making if the two players lack the evidence or cannot understand the evidence or cannot make sense of the evidence? We have a problem of trust. We have more than 150 million papers in the scientific literature. About half of that is medical or biomedical or life sciences. But our trust in them has been eroded, and most of them are not useful. The current forms of evidence dissemination, for example, journal articles or meeting presentations, are merely advertisements that some research has been done. There's far more behind that advertisement, hopefully. There's tons of data, there's tons of iterations of protocols, there's probably deviations of protocols, sometimes there's no protocols at all. What we see is just a snapshot of something that is presented in a clean, fashionable way, in a way that it will appease reviewers and probably go under the radar screen of serious peer review. The typical hierarchies of evidence say that maybe you can do better if you start thinking about big co uh, conglomerations of evidence like systematic reviews and meta-analysis, and ideally these would be systematic reviews and meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. At the same time, 
we have lots of other types of evidence that are also becoming very influential. Experts are still very influential, sometimes justifiably so, very often not justifiably at all. There's new types of expertise that are circulating. Twitter has become, for example, very dominant in communicating information. Some of that is wonderful, but many other aspects could be uh, really spreading fake news or the equivalent of scientific evidence. Even the, the top designs, though, probably have been hijacked. For example, if you look at clinical trials, clinical trials most of the time yield results that are favorable to some stakeholder who has invested in them. This is just one example. We looked at the largest non-inferiority trials with head-to-head -head comparisons that were sponsored by the industry and published in 2011. 96.5% of them concluded in favor of the sponsor. This sounds too good to be true. It's not fraud, but I would argue if we have a study design that is supposed to be rigorous, however, 96.5% of the time, it gives us the same answer, we should skip that step. We don't need it. We should just take it for granted that clinical trials will give an answer that is good for the sponsor. There are ways to explain this. For example, if you look more carefully through the fine print, you will realize in the method section that very often the non-inferiority margin is pretty large. Therefore, the, the trial is almost doomed to get a favorable result of non-inferiority. And there are many other tricks which, again, are not fraud, but somehow that design, which otherwise would be a viable tool, has been hijacked. Meta-analysis are supposed to save us from misinformation, but unfortunately, most of the systematic reviews and meta-analysis that you will hit upon in the literature are meaningless or flawed or useless or all of that. There's about a quarter of a million systematic reviews and about 100,000 meta-analysis out there. And this is the meta-pie of what that literature looks like for meta-analysis. Some of them remain unpublished, and many of them actually have non-favorable results. There's a large number now, nowadays, that are redundant and unnecessary. There's uh, some that are decent, but they're not useful. You look at them and you say, well, but that's not a clinical question or something that I would worry about. There's lots of misleading meta-analysis in some fields that are abandoned, like uh, Canada gene genetics. There's thousands of them that keep being done just because there's many papers out there that can be synthesized, so someone needs to do a meta-analysis for no reason. There's many that are flawed beyond repair, and then there's about 3% that are both decent, well done, and clinically useful. So the question is, how do we get to sensitize people, train physicians, as well as researchers in healthcare research to be able to detect that 3% and to be able to use it meaningfully? One other solution is guidelines. But guidelines also face their own problems. Unfortunately, most guidelines have become marketing tools and are even a potential threat to patients. About five years ago, along, along with other colleagues, we wrote that paper in the BMJ where we created a list of red flags for guidelines. And these red flags are that the sponsor is a professional society that receives uh, a lot of industry funding. The sponsor is a proprietary company or is undeclared or hidden. The committee chairs have been uh, uh, declared to have financial conflicts. There's multiple panel members who have financial conflicts. There are suggestions of committee stacking, which means that the members have been selected, even though they may have no financial conflicts, they're known to have taken positions in favor of one particular mode of action or one intervention. No or limited involvement of experts in methodology um, in the evaluation of evidence. No external review and no inclusion of non-physician experts or patient representatives and community, uh, community uh, stakeholders. If you look across a sample of guidelines circulating even in very good journals, 
about 80 to 85 percent of them have one or multiple of these red flags, which does not mean that they would be completely invalidated, but it means that you need to take them with a grain of salt or maybe even more skepticism than that. If you combine that with the fact that most of the evidence is of low quality or does not even exist, it means that these potentially biased guidelines are driving eventually decision-making in ways that are probably heavily biased. I talked earlier about trust, and trust in the recent literature has been summarized uh, around the term reproducibility and its various ramifications. There's a lot of discussion about reproducibility, not only in medicine, but across, I would say, any scientific discipline. This is uh, some empirical data that uh, we gathered doing some text mining exercises, and we saw a geometric increase in the rate of use of the term reproducibility of results, for example, and the same applies to other terms in the literature. What do we mean by reproducibility? We could mean different things. There's reproducibility of methods, reproducibility of results, and reproducibility of inferences. Reproducibility of methods means that um, we are able to understand what the methods are in some scientific work, and we can make them work. For example, if these methods uh, are a script and they need a software to be executed, uh, to execute that script, and you have some data, you put those together, data, script, and software, you're able to get the same result. How often can you do that for a paper that you're reading in the literature? Almost never, even if you had the time. Most of us don't have the time. But even if you had years to spend, it's just not there. The data are not there. The script is not there. The software sometimes is also missing. Reproducibility of results means that we don't have full trust in the first study that has been done, so we ask for a second study, or a third, or multiple studies, and these additional replications still reach pretty much the same conclusion. And reproducibility of, of inferences means that we have one, two, three, ten, 10, 100 studies, and we ask people who are in the field with different levels of expertise, or let's say all of them with expertise, what do they make out of the evidence? And they may conclude differently based on the very same data. How can we improve our reproducibility track record? How can we improve trust? How can we make research more true and believable? These are 12 families of solutions that have been proposed. Larger scale studies and collaborative work, adoption of a replication culture, registration, sharing, reproducibility checks, containment of conflicted sponsors and authors, more appropriate statistical methods, standardizations and consensus on core definitions and analysis, more stringent thresholds for claiming discoveries or successes, improvement of study design standards, improvements in peer review in reporting and dissemination of research, and better training of scientists and physicians the entire scientific workforce in methods and in statistical literacy. I will go through a few of them that I think may be more relevant uh, for you. One solution that has made a lot of progress over the last decade is registration. In particular, registration of clinical trials has moved from something that was an interesting idea to something that is the default option that everyone needs to use for a clinical trial if it wants to have a chance to be published in a major clinical journal. Even though we have seen improvement, we have still about 50% of clinical trials that are not pre-registered. And in some fields, probably the proportion is higher. In some fields of surgery, registration has made very little inroads compared to other fields, for example. The other issue is how much do we want to register? There's standard platforms like clinicaltrials.gov, but this doesn't mean that all the required information can be captured by these platforms. So for a clinical trial, there would be a protocol, but a protocol could be just one iteration out of multiple iterations and amendments. And these amendments may happen at different times during the course of the study. Some of them may be justified, others may not be justified, some of them may be done before any data have been seen or even before data have been collected. Others may be 
inserted after someone has taken a look at the data, and then you start to worry whether there's a breach in uh, how the study has been run. Analysis plans are something that can make a huge difference. Different analysis plans for the very same protocol can yield very different results. However, it is pretty rare to see highly detailed analysis plans, even in the very best clinical trials. There's always a lot of degrees of freedom that are left on how exactly the data are going to be approached. And finally, if there are analysis plans, there may be deviations, and some of them, again, may be justifiable. But how often do you get to see that? How often do you get to see the full sequence of this is the original analysis plan, and this is now what we did, and this is why we deviated? Here's one example on why the analysis plan can make a huge difference. These are analyses that are based on the uh, most thorough and, and most sophisticated national household survey in the US. Uh, NHANES is a wonderful tool. It has an extremely careful design in data collection and in sampling of the entire uh, US population in order to be representative. And it captures a very wide spectrum of variables. What I have done here for you is that I have analyzed a very simple question. Actually, there's two questions, but let's focus on the one on the right-hand panels, which is whether levels of vitamin E are associated with the risk of death. There's one million different analyses that I have run in the very same data for that very simple question. And on the vertical axis, you have the minus uh, log 10 p-value. On the horizontal axis, you have the hazard ratio. How can you get one million different analyses in the same data set for the same question? Well, you may think of adjusting for something. And there's at least 19 things that you can adjust for death, like age, gender, history of heart attacks, uh, performance status, uh, history of cancer, exercise, heart, congestive heart failure, many, many others. Actually, there's about 70 variables that easily could make it. But if you think about adjusting for 19 of them, you have 10 to the 19th power different models that you can build. 70% of these analyses would suggest that vitamin E decreases the risk of death. 30% of these analyses would suggest that vitamin E increases the risk of death. Unless I have pre-specified what exactly I want to analyze, I get that tremendous vibration of effects and what I call the Janus phenomenon from the Greek Roman god who could see in two opposite directions. I can easily publish that vitamin E decrease the risk of death or I can easily publish that vitamin E increase the risk of death. In randomized trials, maybe there's fewer degrees of freedom, but trust me, there's still a lot. And maybe in many situations you can get easily up to one million different options if you think about not just the adjustments, but many other steps that could be used in the analysis, like censoring a follow-up, how to deal with missing data, uh, whether to combine arms, whether to exclude uh, protocol violations, whether they're gray measurements, and so forth. If you have so many degrees of freedom and so great vibration of effects, it's very easy to get papers like this one, which was one of the 20 highest altimetric score papers last year, uh, meaning got the highest attention across all the scientific literature. With three cups of coffee per day, your risk of death decreased by 17%. And I bet that if I can get the specific data set, I can make it be that your risk of death increases by 17% with three cups of coffee. Should we be rigorous about these degrees of freedom? Here's one approach that may help be more rigorous. Register reports have been adopted by about 150 journals. What they are, they are protocols that are fleshed out as papers. They are written up with introduction, results, and discussion. The tables and the figures are there, but they're not yet populated with the data. And they're reviewed based on the merit of the design. You have the paper, but it's not populated with the exact numbers yet. 
after peer review, you revise this and eventually it gets provisionally accepted. You run the study and then it populates these tables and the figures. One takes another quick look to make sure that you didn't deviate from what was promised. If you did, it needs to be explained. Of course, research is full of surprises and sometimes we do need to deviate for good reason. And then the paper is published. Can this be used? It is used. Uh, and I think that it will become more common, but can it be used for all types of studies that we do? Obviously, it's going to be very difficult or impossible to do it for exploration, for exploratory research. Another tool is reanalysis. Currently, we can get access to more data sets than before. Uh, I remember that uh, about 25 years ago when I started uh, doing um, some meta-analysis of individual participant data, I, it would take me three, five, seven years to collect information from five trials. And it, it was a little bit like being a politician and negotiations was probably as important as the science. Hopefully we have easier access to lots of data sets nowadays, although not as much as one would wish. This is one example of a randomized trial that was reanalyzed for the very same exact clinical question but by different investigators. When that trial, study 329, it sounds a little bit like a submarine, but it's a randomized trial. When it was published in 2001 by Smith, Klein, Beecham, it showed that two antidepressants were effective and safe for adolescent depression. And then 15 years later, independent investigators looking at the very same data set for the very same PICO, the very same clinical question, the very same analysis, concluded that both antidepressants were not safe and not effective. How often is that happening? If it's common, then it means that we cannot trust anything. To be honest, we don't know. I don't think that it is the rule, but I think that it probably happens now and then. Along with Florian Nodet, we looked at all the trials that had been published in PLOS Medicine and BMJ over a period of three years, that these journals have now adopted a standard that in order to publish a randomized trial, you need to make the raw data available. It's a precondition to publication. 46% of these investigators did send us their data, even though we told them that we want to reanalyze your data. So it's a little bit like getting uh, an email from the uh, tax service that, uh, and, and you know, getting an email from John Yanidis probably doesn't sound very good that I want to reanalyze your data to find out that they're wrong. Well, we didn't say it this way. Um, but um, we did reanalyze their data and all of them were pretty much fine. We found some errors, but none of them were such that they would invalidate the conclusions of the trial. This is very different compared to the situation that we had witnessed a few years ago in a paper in JAMA, where we looked at reanalysis of past randomized trials. 35% of them reached an opposite clinical conclusion compared to the original analysis. And actually, the authors of the reanalysis with these different conclusions were the same or highly overlapping with the authors of the original analysis. What was happening until recently was that the only way to publish a reanalysis was to be able to say that you have found something different, even if it was highly confusing. Now people understand that sharing data does not have to be weird. It could be just part of the routine sequence of building scientific trust. Here's an evaluation of two fields, psychiatry and psychology, trying to unearth the raw data behind the highest citation studies published in these two fields in the last 10 years. We were not very successful. Uh, we called that project the, the data arc, uh, telling that we're trying to salvage these data sets that underlie the most influential research in these two scientific disciplines. We got some of these data sets, but many of them were not available or could not be contributed. And here's a map of what the obstacles were. The most common reason that investigators did not send us their data was that this was outside their control. 
we did get in touch with the PI, with the senior author, the corresponding author. Nevertheless, the data were not within their control. Most of these cases, the data belonged to uh, a company, and the principal investigator had no control of the data. In fact, in many situations, I'm not even sure that the principal investigator had seen the data at any point during the conduct of the study. Many others claim that there were legal or ethical concerns, like the informed consent said that we cannot share, so we cannot change that after the fact. Some were preparing their own sharing system, which is a bit ineffective, because I think for this type of sharing, we need to have structures in place that would accommodate multiple thousands and millions of studies, rather than each one of us having to prepare a different repository. Data, data no longer exists. Um, the classic example was in the 1990s uh, when an investigator publishing in The Lancet would not give their data saying that they had been eaten by termites. Um, insufficient resources, which is a very valid concern, especially if someone needs to do it from scratch and there's no existing overarching umbrella for um, being able to share. And finally, researchers still using their data which I would have thought to be a more common reason, at least it's a more common reason in many other situations where I have tried to create consortia, and there's always a tension of whether one would publish their own pieces first and then share, or somehow the consortium would have precedence. In some fields of scientific investigation, the community sharing has precedence over the single investigator. For example, we published that paper in um, Science a few months ago where, as you can see, there's lots of us in the author's list. I was the corresponding author. Um, we argued that for most types of genomic data at least, and I think that that could be extended to other types of data, the public availability has precedence over the rights of the single data producer. Most of the time, the single data producer will generate a very small slice of information that, if analyzed under the very best circumstances, will be uninformative or have very little information. Conversely, the cumulative evidence from dozens and hundreds and thousands of data generators, if analyzed jointly, it can tell us something. And I think that people in omics fields have seen that happen and they realize that you know just one genome is going to say very little if we have a thousand genomes or ten thousand genomes could be bacteria or, rather than humans or anything it does mean more so there will be a transition period where the roles of different contributors to this game of transparency will change a couple of years ago the outgoing uh, editor-in-chief of New England Journal of Medicine used the term parasites for people who use data that others have generated. And obviously, this created a backlash, and uh, he had to apologize and, and write a second editorial saying that he's sorry. But um, obviously, parasites is not a good way to look at that. I would argue that we need to see things as in movies. In a movie, you have a movie director, you have a screenplay writer, you have actors, you have stunts, you have uh, makeup artists, you have uh, lots of people who create a very long list of those who have participated in making the movie. The data generator does not have to be the data analyst, does not have to be the data interpreter, does not have to be all of that. It, it could be shared roles that we're imagining in many types of scientific research. And we have to ask, how do we give credit to everyone? And how do we maximize transparency? How do we optimize cross-checks to minimize errors and biases in the whole process? Another trend which is moving in the opposite direction is uh, actually asking for less sharing. So, so far I've talked about more sharing, but there's some stakeholders who want to share less. And the classic example is many companies, especially in the digital space and information space, they think that databases are gold mines, they, they, they're money, 
and therefore they should not be shared unless you can pay a lot. Um, actually, there's even the extreme that data and information and knowledge should not be shared because it is money and, and therefore you need to have a competitive advantage over competition. The classic example is some startups like Theranos and I was the first to write a paper that uh, Theranos probably has a major problem about a year before Wall Street Journal started publishing their investigations that led to uh, lots of discoveries of uh, subversion of uh, research practices and, and patient rights. Um, I was just walking by their headquarters in Palo Alto, which is very close at home, and I came across that name, uh, Theranos. Uh, having Greek roots, I thought, it's not a nice name for a startup company. Theranos sounds like Tyrannos, which is tyrant, or Thanatos, which is death. Um, why would they pick that name? So I Googled them up, I realized that they think of therapy and diagnosis, and hence Theranos, and they can disrupt the entire healthcare system. That's what they said. They would be testing a hundred times more diagnostic tests at a hundred times less time, at a hundred times less cost, and everything will be diagnosed, everything will be screened, everything will be found, everything will be treated immediately. Just didn't make lots of sense. I started searching for what have they published and I realized that they haven't published anything. So I wrote that first paper in JAMA claiming that their valuation is $9 billion, the highest than any startup currently, but maybe it's $9, who knows. It's not just Theranos though. There's many initiatives in the private space that are moving in the opposite direction of not sharing. Uh, actually, when we looked across all health-related unicorns recently, we realized that about half of them have a similar profile to Theranos. They just don't want to share anything in the peer-reviewed literature about their technology that supposedly is going to disrupt healthcare in major ways. While this tension is clearly existing, if we focus within the scientific literature, I think that we have seen progress over the last several years in terms of reproducible research practices. When we sampled a random sample of the entire biomedical literature from PubMed from 2000 to 2014, we found that very little sharing was happening, protocols were not available, and the situation markedly improved in the last four years. So this is the proportion of randomly picked papers that share their raw data. If you pick a random paper from PubMed, there's about a 20% chance currently that raw data will be shared, which is much, much better than it used to be before. There's also more transparency about funding. There's more transparency about conflicts of interest over the last uh, 20 years. Still not perfect, but I think it is getting uh, quite better. And there's also more papers that are willing to say that uh, I'm not the first one who does that. I'm trying to replicate something. I'm trying to see if what has been presented before actually can be seen again, perhaps in a different setting or under different circumstances. There's also a lot of effort to try to improve reproducibility of computational methods. A small proportion of papers that use computationally difficult uh, codes, they would share those. So we start seeing that happening, not routinely, but more commonly. And I think that this will become more important in the immediate future as many of the analyses that we're doing are becoming extremely complex. They're not just t-tests, they're not just a plain linear regression. There's lots of new tools, especially in the machine learning arena, that are invading biomedicine very rapidly. And there is some sort of balance between model complexity and transparency. The more complex the model, the more difficult it is to be transparent, but I would argue the more important it is to be transparent because otherwise it becomes a completely black box that you have to trust, but you don't really know whether you can trust. It says that, well, you, you just plug in some numbers and you will get the probability uh, of uh, death in the ICU in, in 30 days, uh, but you don't know exactly how that works and what it means and how these variables are contributing to giving you that answer. 
Better statistics and methods. Can we all become statisticians? I mean, clearly not. But uh, I think we need to find ways that within medical research, we do have the right statistics applied. We do have the right study designs and the right statistical methods. Currently, statistics are just a tool to get statistically significant results. That's what it has become, unfortunately. When we text mined the entire biomedical literature, we found that 96% uh, of abstracts that have p-values have statistically significant results. 96% of full papers that have p-values have statistically significant results. Statistical significance doesn't mean anything at this point. Just go back and think about what do these results mean in clinical terms. There are options to replace that tool. We can lower our p-value thresholds. That's an easy solution. It will help us gain some time before we, we drown from statistical significance. Some people argue to completely abandon statistical significance, although that creates problems because then everyone would claim that something is important and significant and should act upon it. We can use alternative inference tools, but how many people are familiar with using Bayesian methods uh, or false discovery rates, for example? Focus on effect sizes and their uncertainty probably a bit better from a clinical perspective. More training in all of that, more guidance. If you look at clinical and research journals, this is the guidance that they give for statistical methods. There's not two journals that agree with each other. So I think we can work a lot on that. And ask for more research is done with proper statistical analysis, that we have some data scientists in the team, that there's better communication between data scientists and other scientists that we don't depend so much on post hoc analysis, or if we do, we declare that these are post hoc analysis. And finally, avoid improper statistical requests by investigators. This is a very nice paper that had 390 consulting by statisticians on a survey. Most of them had been asked to remove or to alter some data records to better support the research hypothesis or they had been asked to interpret the statistical findings on the basis of expectation, but not the actual results, or they were asked to report the presence of, uh, or not report missing data that might affect the conclusions, uh, or to ignore violations of assumptions. So somehow there's pressure to get a desirable result, but the desirable result may not be true. Eventually, we need to ask, why are we doing research? We're doing it for curiosity, but in medicine, we're also doing it to save lives and to help people. And if that's the case, I would argue we need to, to get the best out of that effort. Here's a, a model that is using 11 equations to try to build a universe of research. They sound pretty sophisticated, but the plain version is that in research, we have diligent scientists, the diligent cohort, some sloppy ones and a few unethical ones. Fraud may be about 1%. Those who cut corner, we don't know how many they might be. If you ask the question, do you cut corners? The, question, the answer is no. If you ask, do people in your vicinity cut corners? The answer is almost always yes. So there's some ambivalence about that. But let's say that the most scientists really belong to the diligent cohort. Some maybe cutting corners and very, very few are fraudulent. The model runs through multiple iterations where these people are rewarded based on what they find or what they do not find. And it concludes that eventually the fraudulent and the careless cohort will take over if they are all awarded the same awards for the same discoveries. Why? Because if there's no penalty and there's the same award, then a fraudulent scientist can make huge claims if not penalized and getting the same reward per discovery have a strong advantage. The same for people who cut corners. So we need to find ways to reward the best science and to avoid perhaps even penalize bad, questionable, detrimental research practices. To do this, we need to re-engineer the reward system that we use 
for promotion, for tenure, for funding, for giving credit to people. Until now, we give credit mostly for productivity, just getting more papers out and more money for research being awarded. We should find ways to fulfill the full electrocardiogram, this PQRST, other than P for productivity, give value to quality, give value to reproducibility, give value to sharing, and give value to translational impact. Does it matter? Does it help people eventually? While we're trying to, to do this, there will continue to be a struggle between con good evidence and waste. And it's very likely that for a while, we will continue to have a lot of waste. But we need to be able to reduce that and improve the value of our science. Perhaps we need a revolution, perhaps we need evolution, perhaps we need both. A couple of years ago, along with several other colleagues, we wrote a manifesto for reproducible science where we tried to identify opportunity steps along the course of generating ideas, going after them and implementing them that one could improve the outcomes of the system. To conclude, most published research in medicine until recently has been mere advertisement that research has been done. This means that we can have little trust after repeated failures, and much of our trust has been eroded. Reproducible research practices are becoming more common, and they may help reestablish trust and sort out the depth and the complexity of the medical misinformation mess. There are many possible interventions that may improve reproducibility and improve trust and utility. And transparency, openness, and sharing are all likely to help, but the devil can be in the details. And it has to be very seriously thought on how it will be implemented in different fields. Eventually, we shouldn't lose track of clinical utility. Clinical usefulness should be, should have been, and should continue to be a top priority in designing our research agendas. Many thanks to all of you for being here today and uh, special thanks to a number of my colleagues in my team and collaborators who have helped generate some of the empirical data that I showed to you today. Thank you. <laughs>